Yan Yan. I mean Meiju, Guangdong province. Meiju is a major city in the region that Hakka love. The city government built the Hakka Museum for exhibitions about the history and heritage of Hakka. Today, let's visit the museum together and get to know in depth about this subgroup of Han Chinese. On the wall of the first floor, there is a huge Chinese character. No matter you read Chinese or not, I'm sure you don't recognize it. I didn't, and I still don't know how to type it. It's the first person pronoun in Hakka dialect, pronounced as ngai. A back nasal consonant ng followed by a compound vowel i. Ngai. The consonant ng does not exist in Mandarin, but it's in many dialects. It's believed to be in ancient Chinese language as well. Always quote is from the founding father of Singapore, Li Kuan Yew. Hakka, a Han Chinese who migrated from north and central plains of China to the south some 700 to 1,000 years ago. As latecomers, Hakka were only able to squeeze themselves in the less fertile and more hilly areas. During the migrations, Hakka never forgot who they were thanks to the genealogy book that each Han Chinese clan keeps. The book traces the history of the clan and records the information of clansmen. The genealogy book of the Zhang clan, Taixia village, is a very comprehensive one. For each clansman, it has the information of his name, father, wife, and sons. That's the information needed to make a family tree. It also has the information of where this clansman and his wife were buried or where the clansman migrated to. If this clansman built a house or has outstanding achievements, it would also be recorded. Based on this information, I pieced up not only the history of the Zhang clan Taixia village, but also the history of Hakka. In addition, every Hakka house has a name. Based on the genealogy book of the Lü clan from Long Tan Lo, I made a video on how the Lü clan from Taiwan found their ancestral house and clansmen in mainland China via Tulo. With the information from the exhibition and from Hakka's genealogy books, let's follow Hakka's footprints on their long journey. Many Hakka clans recorded in their genealogy book that their ancestors moved from Shichen to Shibi. The small basin in the Fujian side is Shibi. Shichen is on the other side of the border in Jiangxi province. How did the ancestors of Hakka arrive in this area? There is no study on that. But look, 
There is a clear corridor to the north, which I believe the ancestors of Hakka followed to arrive in Shichen. Today, there are still Hakka villages near the corridor. What is that corridor? It's the Fuhe River that converges into the Gan River, which further converges into the Yangzi River. The map made things clear. On reverse order, Han Chinese from the north and central plains somehow made it to the Yangzi River and migrated via the Gan River and the Fuhe River to arrive in Shichen and Shibi. Basin was not enough to sustain a large population. The ancestors of Hakka had to migrate again. Most chose to migrate southward along the Ting River. This is a piece of land near the Ting River. This is roughly the river bank. Here is the mountain. The land in between is very narrow. Although land is limited, some Hakka still settled down. Hakka villages were built along the Ting River. But more Hakka had to climb over the mountain to settle down in valleys and small basins among the mountains. Gradually, this region with eight counties in West Fujian Province that was named Tingzhou became a Hakka region. Its capital city has been regarded as the Hakka capital. The Tingzhou government was in this town. Hakka in the eight counties who passed the county level imperial exam would be admitted to the institution in the town and take the next level exam in the test center here. Among the eight counties in Tingzhou, Shanghang County might be the best known. It was the transfer station for Hakka's further migration. From Tingzhou, Hakka further migrated to the hilly regions in northeast Guangdong Province, south Jiangxi Province, north Guangdong Province, and east Guangxi Province. As stated in the history records of Meizhou, the locals mostly migrated to Meizhou during late Yuan Dynasty to early Ming Dynasty. They also migrated east, According to the genealogy books of some of the clans in the hilly regions to the east of Tingzhou, many came from Tingzhou. But they speak Hokkien dialect, and they consider themselves Hokkien. My explanation is, when those people migrated there, the Hokkien culture had already matured and had influence there. After one or two generations, the newcomers picked up the local dialect and adapted to Hokkien culture. Then what was there in the hilly regions in North Guangdong? Why could Hakka culture spread there? There were Han Chinese who migrated there earlier, but in the hilly regions, there were mostly mountainous indigenous people. Today, we identify them as Yao people and the Shu people. As Hakka migrated southward, a group of people were migrating north. It was a group of mountainous indigenous people who were believed to originate from Mount Fenghuang, located in between the Dapu County and Chaoshan Plain. The initial encounter was unfriendly. It might explain the emergence of Hakka Tulo, a type of highly defensive houses in Yongding County, the most hilly area in Hakka region. Gradually, those mountainous indigenous people adopted Hakka's agrarian lifestyle. They also adopted Han surnames. They even speak a dialect very close to Hakka dialect. Today, this group is named the Shu people and is categorized as one of the 55 ethnic minority groups. 
Hakka also adopted some of Shu people's traditions, such as burying the dead twice. There were also marriage between the two. If you look at the map, there are many places named the way the Shu in North Guangdong Province, South Jiangxi Province, Fujian Province, and even as far as South Zhejiang Province. For agrarian people, mountain really is not their final destination. They dream for more land. They dream for plants. In early Qing Dynasty, opportunities emerged. One of the destinations was Sichuan Basin, which experienced several rounds of massacre in late Ming Dynasty. In early Qing Dynasty, the emperors encouraged people living in densely populated region to migrate to Sichuan Basin. Favorable tax policies were offered to immigrants. Many Hakka took the offer. Another destination was Taiwan. After the Qing army defeated the Han Chinese who migrated to Taiwan to resist the Manchus, the Qing government allowed people in mainland to reclaim the land in Taiwan. Xiamen was the designated port to go through formalities. Many Hakka migrated to Taiwan during the early to mid-18th century. From this map of distribution of Hakka in Taiwan, it seems like Hakka still mostly ended up in the hilly regions in Taiwan. It makes sense. Hokkien, who lived in the coastal regions of Fujian province, had longer history of migrating to Taiwan. Their population, of course, largely outnumbered Hakka in Taiwan, so Hokkien occupied the more fertile land. The Pearl River Plain was also one of the destinations for Hakka. In the beginning of the Qing Dynasty, the Qing government ordered residents in the coast of Guangdong, Fujian, and Zhejiang province to move inland, leaving coastal regions empty. When this policy was abolished, many Hakka migrated to this area, which consists of part of today's Huizhou, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. Yes, there are also Hakka villages in Shenzhen and Hong Kong. Surprise! Hakka also migrated to the hill region at the western edge of the Pearl River Plain. But this caused a crisis. Hakka and Cantonists living in this region didn't get along well. From 1854 to 1867, the two groups had a large-scale war that caused the death toll estimated to be over a million. The war ended with the intervention of the Qing army. Hakka in this region were placed back to where they were from, mostly in Meizhou. The 14-year war caused the Great Depression in the region, and the Cantonists had to migrate abroad to make a living. It also caused Hakka to migrate abroad, because Meijo really didn't have much land. There was only famine and poverty. Everyone was the victim. During mid-19th century to early 20th century, millions of Hakka migrated abroad. This will be the topic of my next video. It was during the last two stages of migration that Hakka awareness emerged and Hakka identification reinforced. During these two periods, Hakka moved out of the hilly regions and had to interact with Cantonists in West Pearl River Delta and Hokkien in Taiwan, both largely outnumbered them. It was also the case abroad. Chaoshan, Hokkien and the Cantonists who live in the coastal regions had longer history of migrating abroad. Li Kuan Yu described Hakka in Singapore as a closely knit minority. But in today's mainland China, Hakka are neither minority nor closely knit. In China, what ethnic group a person is or where he or she is from does not affect their education and career opportunities. The political system also makes it unnecessary to seek votes from any group. 
identities of different groups are downplayed. We do, however, cherish the beautiful culture of different groups, and we're proud of the diversity of the Chinese culture. In next video, I'll take you to a port in Meizhou. Hakka from Meizhou region boarded ships from there and embarked on their journey to Southeast Asia. A type of cake that Hakka took in the journey are still sold in the town. Hakka's footprints were not only in Southeast Asia. A statue was erected in a square in the town by UNESCO in commemorate of Hakka's journey to the islands in the Indian Ocean. In next video, let's go to Songkou in Meixian. I'm Yan Yan. I make videos about sets of interest in China and histories and stories behind them. Subscribe to my channel. I'll see you next time.